Welcome everyone to day two of the industry strategy meeting. And I'm thrilled to be moderating this conversation where we'll build on some of the themes that were discussed at Davos earlier this year. Many of you may have been there. Uh, where the theme was responsive and responsible leadership. And today we're going to talk about what exactly does it mean to be a responsive and responsible business. So I'm Catherine Cheney, and I cover the West Coast for DevEx. We're a media company focused on global development. And that means I focus quite heavily on the role of the private sector in achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which may be familiar to many of you in this room. I hope so. Uh, recent weeks, as you all know, have brought I think a greater sense of urgency to the role of the private sector in global goals like climate action and just in terms of the role of business uh, in society more broadly. So I'm excited to dig into some themes today given the urgency of this conversation. Um, so today the panelists that I'll induce, introduce momentarily are going to help us build some connections between the conversations we've had here in San Francisco on the fourth industrial revolution and what these changes that technology is bringing to business and society demand from chief strategy officers like all of you in the room. So one of the things we're going to talk about today is the Compact for responsible, Responsive and Responsible Leadership. And that was launched at Davos. Uh, and several of our panelists here represent companies who are signatories of this compact. And we'll discuss ways that you might also get involved in the compact if you're interested. So, with that, I'm pleased to introduce our panelists. First here is Hal Gregerson, Executive Director of the MIT Leadership Center at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We have Raj Kapoor, the Chief Strategy Officer at Lyft. Next to him is Rina Kuperschmidt Rojas, Head of Sustainable Finance at UBS and Society and a young global leader for the World Economic Forum. And finally, Kush Saxena. He's the Executive Vice President of Strategy and Corporate Development at MasterCard. And since you're way down there, we're going to start with you. Um, so I, I spoke with each of our panelists ahead of this session. And um, you know, we discussed we want to move past the jargon and make sure that we all get what we're talking about when we say things like long-term thinking and inclusive leadership. Um, so I want to hear what that looks like at your companies, and not just what you've done in terms of moving toward being a more responsive and responsible business, but how you've done it, so that this group can walk away with some actionable insights. So we'll start with what that looks like at MasterCard. Sure. And uh, look, for those of you who know MasterCard, we've been uh, on this journey of inclusive and long-term growth uh, for a while. And you know, we've been very vocal about, uh, we've been very vocal about uh, sort of our, uh, the leadership position we can take and we want to take in the world around financial inclusion and gender inclusion and digital inclusion. And in fact, even consumer inclusion, right, which is very pertinent in the world of financial services uh, and sort of driving towards consumer choice and so on and so forth. So this is something we've been at for a while. And really, I think uh, this is starts with uh, a recognition of what it is that uh, makes you good, right? And what is the purpose for your existence? Uh, and I think that purpose can have sort of a very commercial, strategic business lens. It can also have uh, a real social, inclusive purpose. And my personal belief is, if you're a company that's attained some basic threshold scale, you must exist for a purpose. So I think recognizing that and pinpointing that becomes very important. And in our case, you know, when our CEO, uh, Ajay Banga, came on uh, you know, seven years ago, uh, there was a strategic view that could have been taken, which was, look, we're going to compete with the Visas and the Amexes and the PayPals of the world. Or there was a view which could have been you know, where, we, where we basically said, look, our purpose for existence was displacing cash. Cash, cash has a cost. Cash, you know, cash uh, drives a lot of activity that shouldn't be driven and really sort of uh, take, over, take over the purpose of driving that long-term goal of uh, cash displacement. Um, so, so I think understanding that purpose, reframing, reframing the market opportunity based on that purpose, and then defining a few lofty goals that you can really pervasively drive in the ecosystem out there and in your organization, uh, in my mind, is step two of that. And so our version of that was, hey, we want to displace cash. Cash has uh, a whole bunch of evils associated with it. The, the lofty goals around that that we, went, uh, that we really declared were, you know, we wanted to get 500 million new consumers mm -hmm. uh, onto, the, onto the financial ecosystem that were unbanked, underbanked across the world. And we wanted to bring 40 million new merchants, right? And if you look at, if you look at the number of merchants out there, uh, there aren't 40 million new merchants until and unless you start going after the small micro merchant in Africa or India, uh, the, the Lyft driver, who's now an entrepreneur and a merchant themselves, right, for example. So, so I think step two of that journey is framing big, lofty goals. Uh, and then I think the moment you do that and you drive that 
across the culture of the company, across any or narrative sort of externally, uh, it really changes the way your people begin to think about day-to-day -day business processes. And so today when we do strategies, we do acquisitions, we make investments, organic or inorganic, uh, that is uh, always at the back of our minds, our people's minds. And uh, you know, like I was telling you, we don't even think twice mm -hmm. about that kind of stuff. And one of the things, we'll get back to this, but you were mentioning mergers and acquisitions, and you've discussed the importance of um, change, what things will change, but also what things won't change. And I thought that was a really powerful point, so hopefully we'll have time to return yeah, to that. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I think at UBS, they started very early on. I mean, I have been a client with UBS for 18 years, and I remember doing my first social responsible investment 15 years ago. So, and I think it became a strategy for the bank in 2014. They created an umbrella, which is UBS and society, and becoming in three pillars. So the way that we do business, which is um, how do we come, become more sustainable. So the way our footprint is, our ca carbon footprint and water footprint, so our buildings. How do we work with our clients? So how do we offer more sustainable investing and impact investing solutions to our clients? So how will we manage their money? And also how do we work with communities? So those are our three pillars. And in 2014, that became our DNA. So that's the way how we work and it's our performance. So we do it in a daily basis. So from employees, communities, and the way we do business. But in 2017 at Davos, we made this commitment that we say we're going to direct five billion um, uh, USD client money on impact investing. Mm -hmm. So we actually went big and said we want to mainstream impact investing and direct this into SDGs projects. So we have been doing this for six months right now. So we actually deploying one billion capital every year for the next five years. So this is a big commitment. And last year we launched uh, the first, um, the first, uh, I think, largest impact investing fund, which is half a billion dollars, focused on oncology, and it has been a successful mm -hmm. fund focused on cancer care. And part of that fund also going to research. So we have been the first bank actually making a large commitment into the impact investing. And we might dive a little deeper into this in a little bit, but um, just to get a sense, when we talk about approaches that this audience can learn from, um, I know that's a challenging task to draw that kind of capital yeah. to goals where, um, you know, some people say there's not a trade-off between profit and purpose. And, uh, but with some of these goals, they're hard to measure and it takes time, especially the societal pillar, right? So can you just quickly say, What's the case you make to people as to why they should invest? Yeah, so actually, well, we take a lot of risk, right? So the cost of capital being the first one and working actually with the private equity fund managers with the traditional ones, right? Convincing them and, and having our theory of change and making the case that no sacrifice performance. So we don't sacrifice performance. So we give them mm -hmm. the, the traditional market returns, but also have the social impact on top. Mm -hmm. So we have been able actually to work with our private equity fund managers to do that. And and report on the social or environmental um, impact as well. So, and then the way we do that is that's to partner, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and to report back. We work actually with the World Economic Forum, with the Impact Investing uh, Task Force, very closely. Mm -hmm. So, we actually last year launched uh, two dream, uh, what we call dream teams. So, we do the Rockefeller Foundation with the Gene, the Global Impact Investing Network, and. Um, and Bridges uh, Ventures and said, there is so many standards out there how to measure impact. So we need to get organized as, a, as, a, as, as, as an industry. So we brought everybody together to Amsterdam and say 50 organizations and we said, this is not about UBS, this is not about the gene, this is not about Rockefeller, let's get organized and give our investors some sort of kind of, you know, education around what impact measurement is is not that we want to create a global impact measurement, but let's come in, in a consensus and say, this is at least the KPIs that you need to be measuring when you are doing impact investment. And then you can customize your, your, the measurement and what is the return of investment when you measure social, social impact or environmental. Mm -hmm. But at least let's have a consensus around that. And then, and that's the word, then I would say, how do you be inclusive and mm -hmm. how do you actually create transparency around mm -hmm. the processes, yeah. Thank you, that's so helpful. And uh, Raj, coming from a company where I think probably many people use Lyft to get here this morning on this rainy morning, in part because they're looking for a responsive, responsible business. Can you tell us what that looks like? Yeah, I, I think it's, it is quite interesting, and it certainly wasn't in our master plan that um, being responsible and responsive would result in 
this significant growth that we've seen just in the last six to nine months. Um, so I think we're, it's an, we're like a real live case study that's going on right now. We have a competitor, they provide similar services. In many places they have significantly more cars than we do, but we've seen a dramatic shift. We think it's because we're executing, but I think it's definitely because uh, people are taking a stance of where they connect in terms of values. My comment on you know how does this happen and, and what are the things that we did? First of all, honestly, and I was involved in the company since day one as an investor. I was the first VC investor and I was on the board, so I shifted recently to be uh, full time. And it didn't. It's not that this was manufactured. There's always been a north star. That's the use the word that we've been using since day one. The north star of our company is to improve people's lives through better transportation and to be encompassing a community and people, putting people first. It's something that Logan, when he started the company, did because he was on the board of the Santa Barbara Transportation Agency when he was in college. Other people were drinking beer at keg parties, and he was talking about transportation issues. This is something that was deep inside of him. The North Star is not how can we maximize the, no, the profit from consumers. The North Star is improve, improving people's lives mm -hmm. um, in doing that. And so then what, the other thing is that uh, you know, it was just instinctive for us to take stance on positions. I think when you really think about is a company responsive and responsible, the test becomes when there are trade-offs. The test comes when you can make a decision that is not entirely popular with everyone mm -hmm. in doing that. The test comes when you're a leader instead of a follower in those decisions. So an example of that is the ACLU decision that we had mm -hmm. before many tech companies made a decision and the statements that they made were very kind of, I would say, neutral mm -hmm. in how they presented it. We took a very specific stance and said, we do not agree with this. We have 700,000 drivers. Many of them are impacted from this travel ban. Their families are impacted from this travel ban. We do not agree 100% and here is some money to the ACLU to fight this on behalf of our community. There were no minced words about that. There were definitely people who, there was a delete lift campaign from those that did not agree with our position, but we stood for our position because we believed in it, not because we calculated that there would be something that would come out of it mm -hmm. in terms of doing it. Mm -hmm. And it is unpopular amongst some people in doing that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, getting to the, the concept of um, inclusiveness, just to, to touch on that a little bit, because I think that's an important concept. I view it as independent almost of long-term alignment with societal goals, but I think it can certainly help. A few things that we've done uh, to make sure that we're inclusive, we don't just have a product that we sell to consumers. We operate a marketplace, mm -hmm. and we have two sides of the marketplace. One side of the marketplace is drivers. Mm -hmm. The other side of the marketplace is consumers. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons why I think we've been successful, especially as of recent, is that we've always put a significant amount of value on making sure that we understand what does the driver want. And in a marketplace, people, and I've been studying marketplaces for 20 years, you usually do have to pick one of those two because there are always trade-offs that you're gonna focus on. And we decided that the driver was really important and that if you naturally pick the driver, the consumer should follow along. But it's a, it's a tough one and there's arguments against that as well. And so things like tipping, which some people don't like, but the drivers like it. Um, you know, things like, paying an extra cost to have a human answer the phone so that we get the feedback loop talking to a driver mm -hmm. versus an email, mm -hmm. including them in that process when we come out with new features. So there's a lot of inclusiveness, I think, is really important to understand that there's more constituents than just your shareholders and your customers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Really helpful. Um, so Hal, I, I have to say in preparing for this panel, I looked up a lot of your talks and your research because I think it gets past some of the jargon that often comes up in these conversations about innovative leadership and really digs into what that means. So I wonder if you can just comment on this theme and maybe draw on some of your recent research bursting the CEO bubble and how that applies to an audience of mainly chief strategy officers. No, thank you. It, it, um, I'm going to start by saying what would it mean to be a non-responsive, non-responsible, exclusive sort of leader? How's that? <laughs> So yeah. it's kind of going the opposite Consider direction. Consider the alternative, yeah. Um, and the reason I say that is the last few years I've had the chance to interview a couple hundred of some of the most innovative and often inclusive leaders in the world. Mm -hmm. So one of them was here locally, the CEO of Charles Schwab, um, Walt Bettinger. 
And he told me the number one challenge he faces is isolation. Mm -hmm. It's when people start telling you what they think you want to hear and they stop telling you what they think you don't want to hear. And last night we heard from Ed Catmull, and Ed, he calls the same thing the dangerous disconnect. Mm -hmm. And so the issue becomes, you know, how distant, how isolated are we from the drivers, for example, at Lyft? And, and in these organizations with these leaders who I would frame as really quite inclusive, quite responsible, and um, you know, quite responsive in that third word, they are active. They consistently get out of their offices, they get into the world, they get on the edge of their system on a regular systematic sort of basis. So quick example. Um, Fadi Gondor in the Middle East, grew up in Jordan, founded a company called Aramex, it's like DHL, FedEx, um, UPS, um, Delivery-oriented company, very efficiency-focused, but Fadi cares deeply about drivers, for example, mm -hmm. because they're the core interface with Aramex with the world. And so he's the CEO, he's the founder, the company is quite successful. He's flying into Dubai, you know those flights into that city, sometimes in the middle of the night, the morning, so he gets in at 2 o'clock in the morning. And this is classic Fadi thinking, who's going to pick me up to go to the hotel? So he has an Aramex driver pick him up in an Aramex truck. <laughs> not, a, not a cushy limo, you're tired, you're exhausted, but he's in the truck with the driver. He engages in a conversation. By the time they're to the hotel, it's crystal clear to Fadi, there are problems here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are driver issues, there are things going on that are keeping this driver from doing the work that she or he needs to do. And so he goes to sleep for a few hours, gets up in the morning, immediately calls an all-hands, all-person meeting, they all come. He, he declares you know, clemency to everybody that no one's going to get hurt by what goes on in this room. We're going to have an honest conversation about what's really going on. And at the end of that, they solve some of the real problems. And 15, 20 years later, that story still gets told at Aramex. And that the, the, the behavior of Fadi still gets done at Aramex, which is those senior leaders, chief strategy officers, CEOs, et cetera, they're out there close enough to drivers, to customers, mm -hmm. to people who maybe are in poverty situations, fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. They are physically in that space. And it causes them, the situations force them to be wrong about something, to feel really uncomfortable inside. Mm -hmm. And when those two things happen, and if we're listening to being wrong and uncomfortable, it silences us. It causes us to be quiet. Mm -hmm. And those are those moments of truth when we as leaders decide, okay, do drivers really matter? Yeah. We're getting that really uncomfortable wrong feedback. Am I going to listen to it enough? Am I going to be quiet enough that I can then respond to it? Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the core of, in one sense, long-term leadership. It's the core of responsive leadership. Mm -hmm. It's the core, obviously, of inclusive leadership. There's no other way but walking ourselves intentionally into a corner where we feel that kind of discomfort and being wrong. I'm curious if any of our other panelists can bring up examples of, you know, we're tackling two big topics, how to be responsive and how to be responsible as a business. And in some ways they go hand in hand. But of course, I love the point that to be responsive, you have to listen. And it's simple, but it's not always done. What does that look like at your organizations, if, if any of you want to share what, what it means to listen? Look. Uh so MasterCard, like Lyft, is also a two-sided marketplace. We've got banks and consumers on one side. We've got merchants on the other side. And when we go become a payment system in a market, uh, we actually become uh, systemically important at some level, mm -hmm. right? Because you are running trillions of dollars of transactions between consumers and merchants. Uh, and you are creating behavior where consumers say, look, I could go without cash, mm -hmm. right? And life, life won't stop for me. Mm -hmm. um, now, with we see this as a as a bit of a political, you know, bit of a political swinging spectrum, uh, but with a lot of what's going on in the world, we are beginning to hear noises from local markets, from local market participants, which say, "You are an American corporation. We don't necessarily want to be tied and held back to you, right?" And so, for us, uh, a big part of being responsive in that context is actually trying to figure out how we become more local, mm -hmm. right? How we become more more relevant in the context of. India for India, China for China, Africa for Africa. And if that means making tough business calls where we've got to spend a lot more money trying to do that or change our business model or even think about how we structure ourselves differently in the context of that, that's a very real active dialogue that's going on. 
so, so in, because we are a B to B to C company, the, the notion of responsiveness and the feedback loop, obviously we're getting from the businesses in those markets. Uh, we spend a lot of time with governments trying to get feedback on what's right for that market. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a lot of how we are sort of positioning ourselves. Yeah, I think also we, we do our exercise to know, not only focuses on our shareholders, but our stakeholders. So we have a materiality matrix, so we know exactly who they are. And we try to listen to our clients, to our employees, to our community. So we know exactly we get involved and we know and we play our role. We do a lot of public policy as well. So we also work with regulators and try to get involved and actually advocate for, for green finance and all these topics that we care about. So I think playing that role and listening to our stakeholders, we, we do a lot of work on that, on that front as well. Yeah, one interesting thing that um, we do in terms of planning is that if you think about running a company, it's a series of decisions that, mm -hmm. uh, that you have to make, and they're usually result in initiatives. And one of the problems that happens, whether it's a constituency like drivers or it's a constituency like your employees, is that by the time the decision reaches them, they, under, they don't understand why. Mm -hmm. And they don't have a mechanism because they may actually have better knowledge to question why than the person that actually made that directive in doing it. So one of the things we're trying to do, and I don't think we're great at it yet, but we're getting better, is you can use communication tools today, like the Slacks of the world or Google Collaboration, but what we always now do is whenever we say that there's an initiative, we have to put the why next to it, and then you just do a very simple thing, which is allow comments. Mm -hmm. And you show there's a few people you have to pick out because if you just tell, allow comments and it's not in the culture, no one does it yeah. because they're afraid they're going to get skewered. So you pick a few people that are at lower levels and you actually reach out to them and say, I want you to comment on this. Mm -hmm. And you see that it's allowed to do that. And that's how you start getting it. You know, it's nothing beats having a face-to-face -face conversation, but when you have mm -hmm. a multinational company like most of you have, you have to come up with other ways to do it. Mm -hmm. I, just yeah. a quick comment on that. So, so Mark Benioff over at Salesforce.com, mm -hmm. um, the engineers in the engineering group started the grievances talk area mm. online about the real issues in the company. And that's just an engineering logic, just like, let's solve problems here, and they can't, they can't not do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they built this, and they use it, and it's successful, and they start getting better in the engineering area. And somebody flipped the switch internally without asking senior leaders to not just have it within engineering, but to have it across the entire organization. Mm -hmm which then all sorts of stuff starts surfacing and some of the senior leaders were a touch uncomfortable with it. Mark didn't even know about it at this point. And then in a meeting he heard about it and he said, let me see it. Hmm. And he looked at it and he's like, there is no way we're gonna shut this thing down. This is some of the most important data we could be paying attention to. Hmm. And, and the issue becomes, it's one thing to have that grievance hmm. area it's another thing to have that area and people trusted enough that they're not gonna get in trouble mm -hmm. for airing information that helps somebody solve the problem. Mm -hmm. That's the issue. And you know, not in, the, in the research we've been doing at MIT about leaders coming out of MIT, one of the things that I would summarize it as is these are problem-led leaders. Mm -hmm. They love wicked, edgy, hard problems. They follow problems, not leaders. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, you start being more honest, you start being more open, you start being more real about the real issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the one, thing, the one thing I would add to that is, uh, look, I think a lot of us in our jobs can tend to take the view that we are alone yeah. in the companies we are operating in or in the spaces we are operating in, right? And I think it helps to take an ecosystem view, right? And how that ecosystem collectively, so you, the other companies, the governments, the, the players mm -hmm. involved, are collectively creating value for end stakeholders, consumer, merchants, whoever that is. Mm -hmm. um, I think the moment you begin to do that, you sort of figure out where in the ecosystem you fit uh, and what could you do to enable the ecosystem, which is not you, but the four other people, five other pl people, players that are creating value. Uh, I, think, uh, I think you can begin to then have a very, very uh, sort of thoughtful dialogue internally around how do you not just in isolation, but along with the ecosystem create that value, right? And so, we go to a lot of markets, like long tail developing markets, where the ecosystem does not exist, right? There's, it's impossible for us to play the role we wanna play because there are no banks or banks are very unsophisticated. What we found in those places is the best, the best way to create value is go work with the government, 
to drive benefits and disbursements and so on and so forth to consumers, right? That gets the consumer, for example, onto a financial, in, into a financial ecosystem. So I think taking that ecosystem lens, uh, which goes beyond your own lens and how you collectively fit to create end value for the end user, I think is a, is a useful lens that drives uh, sort of this behavior towards responsiveness and inclusiveness. I was actually going to ask you, and I'd be curious from, from each of you to share any other learnings you might have um, from other leaders in your industry. So I saw you yesterday in the di big bets on, on digital transformation of finance, and it kind of gets to this working as part of an ecosystem. So I'm curious, um, Kush, if you can talk about at MasterCard what it looks like to take big bets as part of an ecosystem and how you're kind of interacting with leaders, other leaders in the ecosystem, and then for any of our other panelists who might share, you know, we've talked a lot about what this looks like inside your companies, but as part of the ecosystem in your industry, what does it mean to be a responsive sure, and responsive sure. business? So I would, look, I think uh, sort of this broader context around reframing the mock market opportunity as displacing cash and then the four or five big lofty goals that we've declared for ourselves and gone public with, mm -hmm. all of which have a lens to sort of both the commercial side, the commercial opportunity for us, but also <clears throat> inclusiveness and responsiveness. Within that context, uh, you know, the role today or the role we've historically played has been that of a market organizer for the payments ecosystem. That's kind of our bread and butter. Uh, but there, we found that with the advancement of technology, that role is not enough, mm. right? And so, and so there are, uh, there are several, several new areas uh, that we are constantly looking at to sort of build on top of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, a, 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 big, a big new area we're looking at is, uh, or we've been, we've been thinking about a lot, is uh, data privacy. So today we see, you know, today we see uh, uh, billions of transactions a day. Those transactions come married with uh, personally identifiable information. Uh, we think that data is highly valuable both to us, but it's also highly valuable to merchants, to players like Lyft, for example, right? Yet we don't want to be in a position where we are carrying that personally identifiable information. That was a, that was a deliberate call, a difficult call, uh, you know, many years ago that our CEO took and we collectively took where we said we want to strip this data of any personally identifiable information because we don't want to carry privacy risk. Mm -hmm. And it's not right actually for the ecosystem to uh, carry that kind of privacy risk. And so made a ton of investments to be able to do that and yet keep the data valuable, mm -hmm. right? And there's, a deep, there's deep analytic techniques that, that make you do that. Another area we're spending a lot of time on is cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. So our network sees tens of millions of attacks a year and we spend, uh, you know, it's a very, it's a very, very uh, a sort of attractive, valuable target for the, uh, for the cyber attackers out there, given the amount of money we move. And, uh, you know, we've, uh, we, we've, we are trying to take a leadership position in the ecosystem because, you know, we will connect into UBS or another bank's uh, consumer vault. We will take the identity of a person from there, move it over our network, and authorize a transaction on Lyft. Right? Now, something happens, somebody attacks that transaction, it could impact us, it could impact the bank, it could impact Lyft. We need a collective response as an industry on what we are going to do. Um, and so that's another example where we've been spending a lot of time uh, on what the right external response looks like, and then uh, aligned with that, we'll, take, you know, we'll, make, we'll make big commercial mm -hmm. bets. Thanks. Yeah, so just to focus on the SDG 5 on gender equality. So this year we raised um, an impact fund uh, focuses on, on to invest on, on women, so on, on companies led by, by women, at least one, one founder have to be a female, um, $110 million in the US. So half of the money comes from our clients, but it's not enough. So we actually partner with the UN Women to launch uh, something that is called the Gender Lens Investing Institute, um, and then to create a network of financial institutions to create more awareness around the topic, and it's powered by UBS, mm -hmm. um, but it's actually to, um, to create capacity building in other banks and financial institutions around the topic to actually to create more financial instruments around, around that, not just in private equity, but also for, for the listed equity space. Um, so we're creating now the network, so now I have around 10 banks that are joining, and then it is going to be an initiative for the next three to five years. 
So, um, and this is something that I'm very passionate about because I was an entrepreneur at one, one point in my life and I came from private equity and I was, you know, uh, fortunate enough that I, I just raised the money within my private equity fund, but I, I know a lot of the YGLs that are actually raising money and it's very, very hard. I mean, just 3% of the venture capital go to female founders and just 6% probably uh, in, in private equity are female investors. So it's really, really few of the money that goes actually to female founders. So I think it's a topic that, that you know, we can, we can push much more. So that is something that UBS is, is now pushing globally. So, Great. yeah. And yeah, Raj, I'd love to hear from you. You know, at a forum like this where chief strategy officers are coming together, um, across sectors or, or even within sectors to discuss, you know, big bets along some of the areas we explored yesterday. What's the value you see for Lyft in working with the ecosystem? Yeah, so, you know, I'll give an example. The, probably the most dramatic and disruptive change that our industry of transportation is about to go through is autonomous, self-driving vehicles. And um, just to give an order of magnitude for those that haven't, are not deep into it, you know, stuff, uh, networks like Uber and Lyft today represent maybe less than 1% of, of miles driven. Uh, so it's a very, actually small, even though there's a lot of press, it's a very small piece of transportation. Um, studies are coming out now that are showing, there's one out of Stanford, rethink that uh, with AV and electric vehicles, most of them will be on demand in on-demand networks, it's the most efficient way to, to deploy these vehicles. It could be as high as getting up to 95% of miles traveled. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's a massive opportunity, but it's also, it doesn't just impact us. It impacts the city dramatically, it impacts the way people live. It impacts the pedestrian. Mm -hmm. uh, if they see an AV accelerating at them, I'm not sure they'll be excited about it, <laughs> um, at least today. And so how do we make sure that we can bring along all the constituents in and, and doing that? I'll give you one example of a trade-off and a tension that's mm -hmm. there, which is that um, we are trying to, as a network operator, to minimize the cost per mile of a vehicle. Mm -hmm. And so we may want that vehicle to be running around a city going to the highest opportu economic opportunities in between rides in doing that. Yeah. Now, if you take a city view, and you have, let's say, 300 fleets that are doing their own economic local maximization, but the city really cares about the fact that, wait a second, I take a view of the city and you've just created a massive amount of congestion in all the rich areas in the city, or you're never going to the underserved communities that are out there. Mm -hmm. They have a valid concern that this will impact transportation, it'll impact the city if you just leave it up to economic optimization of the local players. Mm -hmm. So how do you work with the city to resolve that? Yeah. You know, do you give them an override? Mm. Do you have a kill switch? There's lots of interesting questions that are going on there that go way beyond just what Lyft is doing and go even beyond what our industry is doing and start to impact cities and redoing those cities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to can, quick... Can I, oh, do, I mean, it's a, it's a collective comment in response yeah. to their, their comments, which is... Um, you know, reaching out into the city, reaching out into the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of Jeff Bezos' com in, comment in his recent annual shareholder letter, which is what he said in 1997. The first was basically absolute customer obsession and focus. Mm -hmm. And when we do that with this second principle, which is don't trust proxy data, mm -hmm. even though they are the ultimate AI and machine learning organization, he's like, it's good, but it's not everything. And this comes to a point about another credit card company, not MasterCard, where we're doing some work around this innovation. And I asked a group of 500 of the senior leaders in that company, when was the last time one of you talked with someone of a lower, in the, in a, in the lowest or lower economic status of your country? Physically, face to face. And about five hands went up in the room. They couldn't remember. It's that kind of physical distance from the real problem mm -hmm. that I think keeps us from solving the problem. Mm -hmm. I think it makes us irresponsible, it makes us irresponsive, it makes us exclusive. Mm -hmm. And so when we get out there, you know, and I had a fun conversation with a Lyft driver coming here this morning. You're changing his life. He's part of the electric vehicle program. He's, he, anyway, I could go on and on about it, and he went on and on about it. Mm. But it's amazing to be in that space. And so the issue becomes when, when someone gets in that world where they're on the edge of the ecosystem or on the edge of their organization, they're likely to get, they're not only likely to be wrong, comfortable, quiet, that's not the point. Mm -hmm. 
The point is, it will change the questions they're asking. Mm -hmm. The reason we're isolated, the reason we're not responsible for asking the wrong questions, and when we get out there in the world that confronts us, they almost force the alternative question. So if you go to Patagonia, they not only make great clothing and other things there, but they have part of their value system. One of their values is, how can we make the rest of our industry uncomfortable? And if they don't act on that, and if they're not operating at that level, they're not succeeding. That's an interesting way of looking at the world. That's a better question. Mm. And they actively do it. I mean, they ran across something in a, in a production chain recently that the rest of the industry was kind of okay with. They realized they were doing it too. They called it, right? Mm -hmm. We're not going to do this anymore. And the rest of the industry was, ah! Oh! But there was no alternative. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just what we do for Patagonia. So I'm curious to hear from each of you. Um, you know, I think one of, one of the things that comes up um, in the World Economic Forum's framing of responsive and responsible leadership is frameworks that eliminate the perceived trade-off between profit and purpose. But I think when you're a for-profit company, that's a challenge, right? And sometimes you need frameworks and coalitions that help you figure out um, ways to achieve both profit and purpose. So um, I actually printed out the compact, um, which we'll return to a little bit later. Uh, this is the compact for responsive and responsible leadership. I was thrilled to see that um, number one, the number one shared conviction is society is best served by corporations that have aligned their goals to serve the long-term goals of society. The sustainable development goals offer a useful roadmap for such alignment. And Rena just brought up SDG 5. It sounds like some of you are thinking through this. It doesn't necessarily have to be the SDGs. That tends to be my focus. But I'm curious what frameworks, those of you who have signed the compact, maybe you can touch on that, or maybe there are other gatherings, forums, conversations that you're a part of, have helped you eliminate this perceived trade-off to the extent that you can in your companies. I'm happy to start, but first I'd like to just add to the comment Hal made, which is, uh, uh, look, I think uh, I've been in companies where that has been the case, right, where the leadership is just not in touch with folks at the edge of the ecosystem they operate in. What I have found in sort of the transformation journeys that I've been part of, not just at MasterCard but elsewhere, which I think could be useful as you guys, as you guys think about this, uh, is that the clarity of purpose helps, right? So, so when, when we declare, for example, we want to get in the next five years 500 million new consumers on the network, mm. the first question people start to ask is, who is this new consumer? What does that new consumer look like? Where do I find that new consumer? Or when I want to get a 40 million new merchants, who is that new merchant? What do they look like? And you drive that hard and consistently across your organizations across the world. The folks in your companies that are operating at the edge of the ecosystem will begin to do that, right? So our market leaders are very attuned to what these folks at the end of, edge of the ecosystem look like. And many times they don't own them, right? So we, are, we work through banks to get to merchants. We work through banks to get to consumers. But we have a very good feel for what these guys look like. And it's an important part of how we, how we drive that. So that was just my, you know, you know your, 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 your point sort of triggered that thought. I think, I think clarity of purpose driven consistently mm. is very important. Uh, but, uh, you know, to your point on, uh, one, I think the compact, is, uh, the compact is terrific. So I would, we were one of the early signatories. I would, uh, I would highly uh, recommend, uh, I would highly recommend sort of taking a look at it. It's very benign and, you know, and yet, and yet useful. Uh, and, and useful how? I mean, is it because it brings you together with other companies that have similar goals? Or? Well, useful in that it, uh, it forces you to take a position, and the position is actually not a difficult position to take, mm -hmm. right? It forces you to take a position, and it's uh, not a difficult position to take. It also forces a conversation at the most senior levels, mm -hmm. and it drives, you know, consistency of thought. And so uh, we had, you know, we've had a conversation around this. Uh, we are very proud of the fact that we've signed it. Our CEO talks about it when he's out there publicly and vocally. And so, uh, you know, I would, uh, I would recommend that. Yeah, and I think we are all together on this, right? We sign it, we as an industry leaders, we are on this. And I think the SDG what has done is create a framework for us to navigate in a better way to understand the commitment of, of the industries. And I think some of the SDG resonate better to some of the industry than the others. So we know that, so we have done our mapping and how pro private wealth, how, how can contribute to the SDGs, not to all of them, but some of them, mm -hmm. because some of them are actually driven by regulation. So 
we don't have the power to actually to move regulation that fast, but probably with our client money, we can do it through investment, so we do, we do know that. Um, but, um, but I think um, also, through the framework on, on the strategy, I think in 2015, when we were with the, with, with the United Nations Foundation and the Project Everyone, the Young Global Leaders, actually we did the whole mapping and also the campaign, I think to inform and educate. So also the, the private sector came along in 2016, so it was the second stage. So I think the framework is useful for corporations to know and understand what their role is. And me, as a sustainable finance head, I know actually and actually invest in your companies. I do know the matrix, and I know what are the SDGs that actually apply to your companies. Mm -hmm. So there are, uh, there are frameworks out there. So if you don't know yet, actually just go there and look for sustainability frameworks that actually help you navigate what are those KPIs that you should, should be following. Yeah. And I want to prep the audience. In just a moment, we'll take questions. So if you're thinking of one, um, maybe get your eye on the mic, and we'll make sure to include you. Um, but Raj, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, so I want to take a little different tack on sure. this. Um, so yes, in fact, when I, when I first invested in Zimride, which is now Lyft, uh, the main driver of it was that I was passionate that something needs to be done uh, from the private industry more around climate change, mm -hmm. and how can we do that? And mm -hmm. taking cars off the road, given the fact that single occupancy vehicles made up the majority of it, the fact that only 4% of the time people are using the vehicles they own just seemed mm -hmm. really inefficient. Mm -hmm. It seemed like a network was the answer. And you could get higher efficiency, and that could get cars off and help climate change. So that was great. And, and that was actually the wrong business we started, because it didn't work, and we had to pivot. But the, the premise was there. But what I wanted to actually talk more about was that that's not enough. Yeah. So I spent seven years in looking at probably 300 companies a year for those seven years, ended up making about 14 investments. And the number of times that I've seen people that really sincerely wanted to make the world better mm -hmm by usually following one of the seven, I mean, the 17 goals basically cover everything that's good out there, probably. <laughs> so like you could hit it if you throw a stone in, in the right direction, um, which is great. But the point is, that's not enough. There's so many startups that said, we're gonna do this, we're gonna cure this, we're gonna do that, but the consumer didn't care. Mm. Like, let's be honest, 95% of the world, 99% of the world doesn't care about the SDGs. You need to provide them value. Mm. And then if you can bring that along, that's the win in doing it. So for us, it wasn't enough that we could make the statement, hey, you should try Zimrider Lyft because you're going to ultimately... Oh, fire alarm. Oh. Must have been something I said, I'm sorry. Uh oh. Oh, Raj. Uh, and I was writing stars around your points. This is I the love first. <laughs> this is the first. You triggered something on this. Well, yeah. hold for just a moment and see if we can ride this out. That's great. I've never had that. Oh, what, do you, what do you do? It's like it. Do we go? There okay. we go. Can there we, we go. Okay, we're safe. All right, now that we're awake, I hope we were before with your comments, but now we're really awake. Yeah, so just to finish off, what I was saying is that um, if it were only those goals, the consumer really wouldn't care. What caused this industry to take mm -hmm. off was a breakthrough in price and a breakthrough in experience. Mm -hmm. And we had a really shitty alternative, which was the taxi. So like you had a bad, like if you, know, if you were trying to fix something that's not broken and add SDGs on top, good luck. <laughs> but in our case, it was such a crappy experience that people have. No one would say, oh, I love my taxi driver or I love the cable company, as an example. Yeah. Um, so we were able to provide a breakthrough experience that also mm -hmm. we think could be beneficial to the world in doing it. So you have to have both. That's the economic driver that's mm -hmm. there, and people forget that. Thank you, that's so helpful. And I, I want you to jump in, but I also want to get at this in your response, which is <laughs> what we haven't heard mentioned in this panel yet is corporate social responsibility. Mm. And I really try in my reporting to look for companies that go beyond CSR and their responsive and responsible businesses. But I think traditional CSR still exists in a big way, and we're trying in this panel to go beyond it. So I'm curious if you can touch on that as well. Well, what I was going to respond was actually that as well. Great. Um, and <clears throat> if you think of Richard Branson and the Virgin Group, they have made a conscious choice between profitability and making a difference. Mm -hmm. It's a conscious choice. If you think of um, Patagonia, they have made a conscious choice in terms of that. And you name the, the number of things on there, they made a conscious choice. Um, a few months ago, after the, this article about bursting the CEO bubble came out, Tony Shea, the CEO of um, Zappos, called me. We had a conversation. 
And he said, you know, you need to come out to my trailer court in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. So they set up, a, they had a distribution facility there in Las Vegas. They put their headquarters there in the north end of Las Vegas. It was very run down, very dangerous, very problematic. And he made a deep exterior commitment, and it was a bit of a profitability choice, but he made a deep commitment to the region, the community he was now placed in. Mm -hmm. He lives in a trailer court there. Now, granted, they're Airstream trailers, but they're trailers. And when I went up and showed up, you know, the first thing I did when I walked in was I was confronted with alpacas who wander around in that little space. And I've never been around alpacas, so, you know, I came up really close, and this one came up really cute, and it got really close to my face, and then it went <laughs> and spit in my face. But, so I was wrong and uncomfortable and quiet for a moment. But the point becomes, he created that trailer park in order to create conversations mm -hmm. in the community. Mm -hmm. And he invites people in at the fireplace at night from all over to have conversations, to have these intersections of the ecosystem. And he's put $385 million of his own money into revitalizing that area. It's real money into it. And that trailer park is sitting on the road, basically, where there was an invisible wall. You did not walk past that road if you were going to be safe. And today, you walk past that road, and you're pretty darn safe. It's a different space. And in terms of community, at the end of my three-day visit there, I happened to be in another community space made out of cargo containers where they had a big rock concert going on, not a big one, a small one, actually. And there were all kinds of families from all sorts of socioeconomic statuses in that place enjoying themselves. And I just sat for a moment thinking to myself, wow, Tony made a choice. And he's trying his best to run a very viable, successful business. He made a very conscious choice, Community Matters. And then I walked to finish my day over to the only independent bookstore in that area, in Las Vegas, that Tony co-funded in part. It's got to be profitable, it's not going to succeed. But the front of that is all kinds of amazing books, and the back of his independent bookstore is a place where kids in the community come to write their own books and produce them. Mm -hmm. It's give back. And the same thing for Cirque du Soleil out of Montreal, you know, with Guy de Liberté, the founder there, they have made it Serica a conscious choice. Mm -hmm. We're going to be very profitable, but we're going to choose to make a difference in the world with water. We're going to choose to make a difference with youth with Cirque du Monde, which teaches kids at youth how to have purpose, how to have a reason. Mm -hmm. And so again, to me, these organizations where the leaders are out of their bubbles, they're in the world, they're in the ecosystem, they're getting confronted with stuff that makes them uncomfortable, they're the ones who are stepping up, I think, to the pact-like principles there and making the difference. So I have a question on that, but at first I want to see if there's anyone in the audience with a question to make sure to include them. Anybody? We want to make this as useful for you as possible, so make sure if you have a question, you ask, and you can walk away with something. Back there. So we've unfortunately seen the real or perceived, and I think it's real and perceived, issues of social equity or inequity playing out in governance. It's played out, unfortunately, in the hearing that's going on right now. Uh, you know, so what are your thoughts about this issue of whatever you call it, social equity, inclusive economic development, mm -hmm. and how do you all see that issue? Because it translates to society, you know, to governance, you know, and risk in governance. And I'm sorry, I should have asked before, would you mind sharing who you are and where you come from? Sure. Uh, I'm serving as a senior advisor to the World Economic Forum on accelerating uh, circular economy policies. Wonderful, thank, thank you. you. So, um, just a comment there. I had an interesting experience with someone you, pro you may have heard of, Clayton Christensen, um, who's a professor at Harvard and spoke recently. And he came and spoke to our 20th reunion. And he was really sad, almost crying on stage. And he said, capitalism has failed. Mm -hmm. if you, and you know, I won't go into the details of it, but in short, if there's the metric that everyone cares about, which is earnings per share, what we've now shown after several of the most recent recessions is that there's jobless growth. Mm -hmm. And that profit, and we're sitting in a place where there's five times probably or some significant amount of capital. I think at, the, at Davos it was mentioned that, is it eight families now that have more than half the wealth of the entire world? Yeah. So the solution is not the way that we've been doing things. Mm -hmm. And so this is out of context of Lyft or anything, but I'm just making the comment that um, we have to come up with another metric. Otherwise, this problem will only get worse, and it actually ends up, long run, being a profitable thing to do because there will be no one to buy the goods and services that we're mm -hmm. selling except for eight families. 
and how many toothbrushes do they need? <laughs> so there's something that has to be done that has, because that one metric no longer works. That's about efficiency. It's not about job growth. Yeah. And efficiency is going to become, in the next 20 years, 10 times more about artificial intelligence, software, non-human jobs. Mm -hmm. And it's hitting our industry as well. Mm -hmm. yep. I mean, a, a quick response on that from building on that and, and <laughs> is basically, to me, that kind of inequity persists when people live in bubbles. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> when we're comfortable, we can live with inequity. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. it's that straightforward to me. And I think, you know, Play's a good friend and I, and I get where he's coming from and I feel the same way. And, and to me, one of the starting points in that is us asking ourselves, when was the last time we were with somebody violently different from us, who said something or asked us a question that made us deeply and awkwardly uncomfortable. Mm. And if it doesn't happen once a week, capitalism has failed. Mm -hmm. Because leaders will make choices by proxy data, too insulated, too isolated, and, you know, that's why I don't want that. That's, that's a hopeless world. <laughs> We've got to do something about it, and to me it's, it's as simple as the 50 of us sitting in this room making a choice. Who am I going to talk to in the next seven days who's not like me, who has the potential to make me really uncomfortable. And maybe even, if you would add this, going a step further to make sure you're hiring people not like you and having people on your board totally. not like you. Yep. Right. Totally. Yeah, yeah my, my only thought on that question is, uh, look, technology, which is a form of capital, is in my mind a big driver of some of this inequity. And conventional economic theory says, okay, so <clears throat> you eliminate low productivity jobs and new productivity jobs will come in and people will always be constructively engaged. Which makes, uh, you know, which makes the underlying assumption that the uh, folks are able to, they're actually able to take these new productivity jobs. And we've had a lot of conversation here over the last couple of days. We had a great dialogue yesterday in, the, in one of the AI breakouts mm -hmm. on, uh, on upskilling, mm -hmm. right? And I think Peter, Peter Doolin made a, made a really good comment here yesterday on that as well. And I, I think that is, that is a real area of call to action for all of us. We should all, this is not just the government, this is not just the education departments, this is not just the universities, it's all of us that need to get with doing anything and everything we can to upskill. And uh, within, within the worlds we operate in, with the folks we interact with, uh, in my mind, uh, if we can do that, if we can expose the things, the technologies that we use, and uh, create frameworks for education around those, I think you solve a lot of these challenges around inequity. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, I think that's actually a, uh, that's actually a real, uh, sort of a real opportunity for all of us to collectively work on. Other questions from the audience? I just wanna make sure we're not missing someone who does have one. Otherwise I can try and ask on your behalf what I think you're thinking, we'll see. Um, I wanna make sure if there's any advice that any of you have. You know, you touched on advice. Um, but, and maybe rapid fire here, because we're, we're coming to a close, but, um, you know, we have a room filled with chief strategy officers, people making decisions in their companies, people who obviously are interested in the topic of responsive and responsible business and want to get their companies um, to go even further down that road. What advice do you have, if you haven't already gone there? Um, well, I, I can start. So first, I, I guess use this network. I think it, it has been very useful for us as a corporation. There are different task forces within the World Economic Forum that probably you are aware of and probably the ones that you don't know. So probably use uh, the time here just to connect and also to explore other avenues. Um, just talk to the people that are here um, and, and think about not just on the industries that you are in, but also try to explore different avenues. So things that, that might be interesting for, for your industry and also based on the SDGs and, and try to figure out the path that you want to go. Uh, the second thing that, that you, I, I think that you, I will encourage you, you have the opportunity actually to influence your, your senior leadership. I think it's our job to think about where we want our corporations to be three years from now. Mm -hmm. So use that years and try to put those, you know, those thoughts in their heads. And I think I never uh, had, um, um, I think, a backslash from, from my senior leadership when I come and, and, and think about an idea. What do you guys think about this, right? 
And then I got their attention and said, oh, that's something interesting, right? Um, and what about thinking about this right now and probably in three years from now, what are we going to do? So I think it's my job actually to think about all these things. I think use that opportunity. Um, but I think that the WEF as a platform, it has been very useful for us as a corporation and to build partnerships. I think the first thing what I do and I see a challenge, not also just as a young global leader, but also in, in, in my acting head right now, is just the first thing that I think is how do I activate the ecosystem? Mm -hmm. So who do I know? And then, and then I called the wife and I said, do you know someone in this corporation that I, I need to be talking to? So I, I really use the platform yeah. often. Very helpful. And I, I'll broaden it to say, um, as we wrap up, advice or calls to action? Um, things people might consider or things you really hope they'll do walking out of here? Yeah, so look, as chief strategy officers, uh, some of us, a lot of us, uh, will tend to analytical frameworks and profitability frameworks and PowerPoint and Excels and uh, what I found useful uh, is really sort of to keep that aside for a second and just lean into your personal self a little bit and ask yourself the question of, you know, why? Why, why should it matter to you personally to be uh, a part of a leadership of a company that's inclusive and responsible uh, and responsive? Uh, my answer, my own personal answer for that is pride. I love the opportunity to be able to sit here and reflect what MasterCard does and talk about it. It's a, it's a source of great pride for me personally. So I think find your reasons, because I think you'll be most convincing. You will, you will find the ability to bridge the sort of the commercial challenges or the profitability challenges or the cultural challenges with, with the intent on this. Uh, and uh, all of us are in positions of tremendous influence. So, uh, so I think if you're, if you're able to find your reasons to do this, uh, I, can, you know, I, think, I just think that can be very, very impactful. So I think as been, has been discussed a lot at Davos, we are living in a time where there is absolutely a lack of trust for leadership and a lack of trust in institutions. And I think the, the only way that we can get out of this is for every institution to really dig down deep into what is authentic. And what authenticity to me is really something that um, it's amazing how people can see through it now. Yep. This is an unprecedented time of consumers, city, governments, of everyone just being able to see right through whatever you say to what your actions are. Mm -hmm. You know, the, I, I would leave with that famous saying, which is that uh, character is how you act when no one else is looking. Mm -hmm. That's what people are looking for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I just add a couple of quick comments. Um, <clears throat> From my perspective, isolated leaders cast shadows on the people around them and to some degree on the world around them, even darkness. But when somebody makes that decision to be with different people, to be in different places, to be vulnerable at the core, that's the moment trust starts getting built. When we're wrong, when we're uncomfortable, when, when the situation is so powerful we're quiet, like Clay was with you about capitalism has failed, it causes us to rethink things. And for me, instead of casting shadow, it's, a, it's not just a company decision, but it's, a, it's an individual choice about how I spend my time, who I'm with, where I'm at. And, and to me, the leaders that I've been talking about, they cast light. Mm -hmm. They bring light to people, and they cast it, and they increase it, and it makes a difference. And I choose light. And to do that means I'm going to be very vulnerable, and I'm going to be exposed. But that's the price. That's the price of building something like you're trying to do that makes a difference. So. I hope we'll continue this conversation um, today, of course, and also at Davos next year. One thing I wanted to note is that we are talking about some pretty significant shifts underway and that we hope to see in companies, but it's hard to measure the impact of these shifts toward long-term thinking and inclusive leadership. Um, that's something that the World Economic Forum is actually working on measuring, and they're going to talk about that at Davos 2018, so just a little preview. Um, and so for those of you tuning in remotely, thank you. And for those of you in the room, if you're interested in learning more about the Compact for Responsible and Responsive Leadership, you can speak with Adam Robbins, who's just over here. So just raise your hand or catch his eye if you're interested in talking more. Um, meanwhile, please join me in thanking these great panelists for a wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you.